Hello, everybody. Hello from me. Hello from Penelope. Uh, we're here to get started on Lecture 1, Two Ancient Theories of Emotion. We're going to spend some time with Plato and Aristotle, and you go, oh my god. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be that bad, maybe, as you anticipate, even if you're not a big-time philosophy fan. Let us then uh, take a look at this. Uh, notice the OH. OH. Yep, you got it. the pose. If, if you Google OHIO pose, uh, last time I did this, there was about 68,000 hits, believe it or not. What about people from Ohio State love to do this pose and do it everywhere on the frickin' planet, right? As soon as they send four Buckeyes out into space, like Mars, they're going to be doing this on Mars, first thing, I guarantee. They'll set foot on Mars and they'll be doing an OHIO pose uh, almost instantaneously. Anyway, we're going to talk about lecture one. We're going to move through it. Homework one is embedded in this and also in 1.1, the Confucian um, perspective as well. So uh, we'll be operating in teams of six uh, to do this homework assignment. And, and you'll see that the, the homework is busted up into six pieces. So each of the six of you get to do your own part. And that way we can account. Uh, I've had students talk to me, oh, I don't like to work in teams. I don't like to work in groups. Uh, a lot of people don't carry their weight. Well, we're going to be able to clearly identify who does what uh, because of the way I'm setting these assignments up based on your advice. So uh, from Greek and Latin, we have two words, pathos and patoir. And pathos in ancient Greek translates at least roughly to emotion. But notice the term is not being used. We're not going to encounter the term emotion until the late 1800s. Uh, so so uh, it's, it's, it's close, right? And when we look at pathos, we see terms like psychopathology, uh, mental illness, right? And, and psychopath are derived from this concept. And I believe it's lecture 6.1 where we're going to talk about emotion in the psychopath and, or the absence thereof. And so it's a fascinating intersection of, of Greek language and modern uh, psychological reasoning. Patois is a Latin term roughly meaning passions. And we'll see that passions is a more common term that's used throughout the, let's say, the next 1500 years as we move. Now, in designing this course, one of the big questions is, what do I include? What do I exclude? What's the general theme of the, uh, the, the course? And I think I kind of liken this to uh, kind of a football strategy on, that, that do we go deep or do we go wide? And, and these conceptualization, conceptualizations are largely ignored. Most emotion studies tend to begin with Darwin and James. So William James, Charles Darwin, it's like the idea of emotion didn't exist before that, and, and that's very much not the case, right? Empirical approaches that were typified by Darwin, William James, and those that followed, right? Empirical approaches push us towards understanding in depth, but, but they confine our exploration to what is amenable to being measured in the laboratory. And we might not want to just completely devote ourselves to an empirical perspective. And in this class, what we do is we take two perspectives and we're going to bounce back and forth. So we're going to, yeah, hard edge empiricism. Sure, I was trained at Ohio State in the social psychology department as a graduate student, which is probably the most empirical place on earth but we're going to bring metaphysics into this as well. So metaphysical approaches tend to offer explanations that are more, are more mythological than, than empirically uh, supported psychology studies. So we're not going to discard the metaphysical approach to understand emotions so that we can embrace solely the empirical stance. We're going to go back and forth. And I think that's in the spirit of critical thinking and the spirit of flexibility. Now, this course really is our story and it's our story of emotions and throughout the course we'll be looking at our own emotional experience but advised and with increased perspective from the ancients uh, to, to medieval times to modern times so we're, we're going to hit all those stops you know in the way back machine if you will so the further back <laughs> we try to tell the story the less accurate we are likely to be, though, and, and that's kind of a caveat here. So we kind of operate with a little more flexibility when we talk about uh, an ancient theories. Now look at this piece of work here, the, this beautiful marble sculpture, right? And this is by Camille Claudel. And Camille Claudel was a student of who? Yeah, think about that for a little bit. 
uh, the, and, and what's the title of this work? Young Girl with a Sheaf, right? and this is before 1887. And, and notice uh, the symmetry, the beauty of this piece, the smoothness, the grace kind of, of the piece. And artists, fascinating people, especially their relationship to emotion and the expression of emotion. So you might stand back anytime you go to a museum or you're looking online at artwork, say, what is the emotion that the artist is trying to convey? What is the emotion that the artist might have been experiencing at the time? So here's Camille Clodel, right, 1887. Let's jump ahead a couple years. That is 1893 to 1900 works of Camille Clodel. And let's look at this piece of work. And there's something very different going on here. And what do we know about this? Well, we know that Camille Claudel was Auguste Rodin, you know, the thinker, right? The thinker, this was his student. And it was also his lover, right? So Camille was lover and student of protege uh, of Rodin. But the rub is that Rodin was married and had a family and was never going to leave his family uh, for Camille Claudel. So as she realized that the more she loved Rodin, uh, and, and there's stories that maybe he took advantage of her, uh, maybe taking some of her work or some of her designs, but her love was never going to be fully realized with Rodin because he was never going to leave his family or his wife. And, and we can see that how her work over this period of time, right, um, changes. It changes in its emotional tone. And, and we though owe this to artists. Now, I promised you in the, in the first lecture, in the introduction, that we'd talk somewhat about photography, that that's going to be kind of a theme. So I, I, I want to talk about the notion that, that images capture, convey, and cause emotion. And it, it's possible that images are so powerful that repeated exposure to images can actually facilitate, let's say, political change. Uh, change of all kinds, but political change. And I've got, so, uh, I've got some images that are hard to look at. I've got some tough ones coming up here. So I'm just going to warn you uh, on this. Um, this first one is an image that I was exposed to when I was in middle school. And, and this is what I saw on the, on the news every night. And, uh, you know, I graduated from high school in 1975. So you put me in middle school, we're talking 71, 72, 1970. And this is Vietnam War era. And here we have... Uh, picture that's probably been shown literally millions of times and, and, and this is where a girl had her clothes burned off uh, in a napalm attack and you can see the soldiers moving the civilians hopefully away from harm but it might be a little late for that and it was images like this that were shown repeatedly on the news that made the American public less and less willing to stand behind our efforts in Vietnam and eventually led to the dissolution of the war I believe at least in, in part so we can see these other images like the woman holding her baby being evacuated in the helicopter uh, or, or the man holding uh, his, his napalm burned child there and those two images are especially powerful I think the most horrifying image that I remember is the image in your uh, what upper left there and that's a Buddhist monk protesting the war and he's self-immolated that is he sat down in the middle of the street he poured gasoline on himself and he lit it a fire uh, when you see this kind of intensity when you see this kind of dedication to an ideal that he's willing to sacrifice himself in one of the most painful ways possible to protest our involvement in Vietnam Images like this have the potential to evoke emotion. They freeze that moment in time, as I discussed before, and, and you can see the power of these images. And, and the feeling then sits with people, and, and we revisit the image, and it recreates the feeling. Um, let's, let's fast forward to, to modern times, to obviously in my lifetime, and let's take a look at this image. And, and I love this image. I, I think this is a most powerful image, and it's a most ironic image. And you might take a moment or two to think about and kind of just immerse yourself in this image and what's going on here. Uh, and images like this, we say, wow, this looks like perhaps, you know, I look at this, your opinion may vary, but I say this is really a disproportionate display of power.
but then who has the power in this image? Who is the proactor? Who is the reactor? And, and images like this are especially powerful because maybe it's not so simple. It's not like a child sitting in front of a birthday cake with a smile that's about to blow out the candles where, where the emotion is clearly defined. We have an image like this where the emotion is open to conjecture and note that people's political philosophies their stances might in fact change their interpretation dramatically uh, of this image or this image and, and this is another powerful image that, that uh, really just causes people to take notice uh, and, and Notice that images can unite, but images could also divide, and, and so I don't know where to go with this image. Uh, what do you think, Penelope? Let's take another one, and, and this was uh, this is in Charlottesville at the rally when when the person drove the white supremacist drove his car into the crowd of people, and we see frozen in time. We see tennis shoes being literally ripped off of somebody. We see people in the air frozen in time. We see people in the audience reacting, not audience, but in the crowd reacting uh, immediately to this. And these images are intended, this is what photographers do, is try to capture the moment and in this case convey the emotion. Uh, an another powerful image, obviously I'm not going to choose the images of low power. And, and we, we can look at this and, and say, what does this convey? What does this tell us about ourselves? Because remember, I opened up this lecture really saying this is the story of, of you, but it's the story of us, right? And, and when we look at these images, imagine someone looking at these images 100 years from now and going, wow, wow, what, what was going on there? What was the story that, that we're looking at? So when we t turn our, our lens backward, when we look back, there's times before uh, photography, but it's not to say that uh, an image wasn't frozen in time. How far back can we go in this discussion and this exploration of emotion? Well, the Greeks and the Chinese certainly have something to offer, and we're going to get there pretty quick, but I want to take a, a, a diversion even further back, maybe about 40,000 years ago. Uh, we've, been, we've been around a lot longer than the Chinese or the Greeks. And, and I look at these cave paintings, and, and these paintings, of course, were made by someone in a cave placing their hand against the cave wall and then blowing a colored powder, uh, leaving then the, the powder to do the outline of the hand. What did this person feel as they were doing this? What was their motivation to do this? It's a lot of work to find this powder, to grind this powder, uh, and then once you've invested the work in this, the, the powder is somewhat precious. What caused them to expend this effort, the, this value? What are they trying to say to us? Uh, was this something as simple I was, as I was here? Does this then describe a, a, a knowledge that someone else will see this? What, what is the story behind this? And this is when we get into trouble because there's really no clear way to answer that question. Now I want to share with you a, a series of books that I read uh, in my teens and uh, I almost couldn't get enough of these. There were four books in this series then. There's a fifth now. And it's The Clan, the Clan and the Cave Bear and this is by Jane Owl and she's got anthropology background and she's an amazing author, a novelist, and what she did was she created these books that are about 40,000 years ago and, and really novels in a setting of 40,000 years. And uh, well, here, let, let me read the, the, the description here of the first book in the series, right? When her parents are killed by an earthquake, five-year-old Isla wanders through the forest completely alone. Cold, hungry, badly injured by a cave lion, the little girl is as good as gone until she discovers a group who call themselves the clan of the cave bear. The clan, left homeless by the same disaster, have little interest in the helpless girl who comes from a tribe they refer to as others. Only their medicine woman sees Isla as a fellow human worthy of care. She painstakingly nurses her back to health, a decision that will forever alt alter the, the physical and emotional structure of the clan. And, and, and what we're talking about, though, is an amazing story that describes the emotional experience, the interaction of people, and these people are of essentially different species, right? Isla is Cro-Magnon, right? Homo sapiens. The clan of the cave bear is Neanderthal, and we have splendid evidence that demonstrates that Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon coexisted, which is an amazing idea to think about 
two different human species and ultimately I think we're finding out so far that there maybe are six different human species of which there was uh, probably substantial overlap, right? So the clan, uh, although the story takes place, you know, 35,000 years ago, its cast of characters could easily slide into any, any modern tale. The members of the Neanderthal clan are, are ruled by traditions and taboos, find themselves challenged by their exposure to this outsider, right? Who represents the physically modern, more modern Cro-Magnon. And as Isla begins to, to grow and mature, her natural tendencies emerge, putting her in the middle of a brutal and dangerous dangerous power struggle, right? So it's a story that really could be transported uh, in, in, into our current times. And as an aside, I don't know if any of you have had your DNA tested, and I've talked to a lot of students who don't think it's a good idea or are not interested because of what might be done with their DNA. I did have my DNA tested, and uh, well, in part I found a half-sister, right? I was adopted, and, and Rachel and I found each other. We share father, but that's kind of an aside here. What I find is I carry about 3.5% uh, Neanderthal variants on my genome. <laughs> so, <laughs> for better or for worse, way back when, there were some Cro-Magnons getting busy with some Neanderthals, and, and we bear the genetic evidence of, of those affairs, if you will, and, and that just blows my mind. It also, I mean, probably has little to do with our current emotional experience, but maybe it does our capacity or potential for emotion when we see that two species intersect. So you'll find this mixture is very common in Europeans and especially Northern and Western Europeans. Uh, those people who are considered white carry a, a, a pretty substantial Neanderthal genome. Where you see no Neanderthal genome, interestingly, is Africans. Uh, so uh, Africans, and, and therefore African Americans, uh, are likely to have no Neanderthal variants in their genome. They're pure Cro-Magnon, actually the more advanced species uh, of the two. There's some irony, if you will. Now, without recorded history, though, we run into a serious problem. We can conjecture like Jane Owl did in, in her book, and that's cool to imagine the times, and, and I do recommend the books. They're, they're long, but they're well worth the read, and they read quickly. As compelling as Owl's created world is, she wrote the book in modern English, and, and this is another issue, especially we're going to explore at the end of the course when we get to lecture 9 and 10, and we start looking at deconstructionism and the power of language, right? It, it, it therefore embodies her created world with concepts tied to expression in modern language. So there's going to be a substantial disconnect about what was actually transpiring or occurring because we run into this issue and we'll say it now, but we'll leave it alone for a good long time in this course is if there's not a word for it, can we feel it? If there's not a word for it, does it exist? And these are some of the questions that deconstructionists toss at us. More on that later, though. It's quite possible her experience of her characters as described it might be quite a bit off the mark. So while these are compelling books and they, you can immerse yourself in them and go, oh my God, and, and, and they really transport you, it might not be uh, at all an accurate picture uh, of how reasoning took place in those days. But she's describing a world that existed 40 or 50,000 years ago, so we can cut her some slack. So uh, enough of the pre-recorded history, let's, let's move forward to, to recorded history and we'll talk about Socrates. And, and, and Socrates especially will talk in terms of anger and, and certain philosophers kind of had pet emotions, if you will, or were more interested in certain aspects of emotion. So Socrates explains to us as part of the soul, the, the spirit resides in anger. Anger has the ability to be both connected to reason and appetite. And, and and you, we can see these terms, that, that reason obviously is the cognitive component, and appetite for the Greeks is often kind of this visceral desire. Uh, we might equate it to drives in Freudian terms, right? A sense of being wronged in the former and frustrated in the latter might result in anger, right? So, uh, so if, if someone somehow uh, insults me, then, then I, I might anger, right? If someone frustrates my, takes the last chicken wing that I'm reaching for, I might become angry. And, and I'm using appetite in a very literal sense there. But to have ju injustice done is 
a rational calculation that yields the experience of having been wrong and therefore angered. And, and we're looking here at a written exploration already, you know, 2,000 years ago of the relationship of reason to emotion. And, and it appears that Socrates is pretty much saying, hey, to become angry, at least in this context, is the result of reasoning. Hey, I was entitled to this and I was deprived of it and therefore I'm justified in, in being angry. So, to wrong oneself, though, or to wrong another, was to create an inward-directed anger, and this could be shame. And notice that now we have a self-referencing emotion, and this is very early in the game. So, we ha I really admire the depth of Socrates' thought in this. Reason and anger become ready allies, right? And we often think ourselves into an angry state. The dichotomy is good, bad, right, wrong, uh, just, Unjust, ought not arise, is emotion the source of these dichotomies? Or are these dichotomies that are created culturally, we adopt them as reason and then evoke emotion as a result of it? Who's driving the bus here, reason or emotion? And this is going to be a critical question throughout the course. Now, homework one then. For one of six folks, and there's going to be six components to this, so you'll be in your group of six, and, and this is actually point number three, but fear not, you can see the entire assignment in uh, Carmen. But I want to link these up strongly to uh, the material. Describe a scenario of the tension between reason and anger. Be sure to completely capture right the tension and the outcome of the struggle so one person will fill this out they'll, they'll think about this they'll they'll provide the examples describe it this is maybe no more than like two paragraphs right and then put your name and 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 the description on it right so that we know exactly what it is you're doing all right I'm gonna break here uh, and, and then we'll come back in just a sec